This video is looking at the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, it's obviously a foundation, if not the foundation, of Christianity. It's got general application in terms of understanding the resurrection as an introduction and overview, uh, although it does have some specific focus on the EDUCAS A-level RS Christianity paper. Before we look at the resurrection, it's worth having a quick look at the crucifixion. This is in the realms here of very simple historical narrative. There's nothing strange at all about crucifixion in first century Palestine. It was pretty routine for the Romans. It was the way they dealt with anybody who they considered to be in some way troublesome and to put Jesus' uh, crucifixion in context. Uh, in 4 BC, um, the Roman general uh, Varus crucified 2,000 Jews. If we look in the account of Jesus' crucifixion, we've got uh, three of them crucified together, and the other two are described as uh, lace days, that's the Greek word, and the English translation of that is bandit, brigand, um, and it's a term used by the establishment of the uh, Jewish revolutionaries, the zealots. It's also important as we look at the crucifixion of Jesus uh, to establish that we are starting uh, our exploration of the resurrection with a dead Jesus. Uh, you find uh, the hypothesis presented from some quarters uh, that Jesus had maybe had just simply passed out uh, and then was revived in the cool of the tomb. And so uh, it wasn't a resurrection. He just um, wasn't dead. Um, if you look at the accounts of the punishments inflicted on Jesus before he was nailed to the cross, uh, that was sufficient to kill some men. Uh, there's just no way that uh, even if Jesus had somehow not been dead when he was put in the tomb, uh, there's no way that uh, the battered, bruised, damaged, uh, half dead uh, man who then staggered out of the tomb uh, could possibly persuade anybody that he was in fact some resurrected uh, son of God, the Messiah. So we need to look at Jesus as um, somebody who'd actually died. So we're looking at a fully human death on the cross. Now that's got implications for the Trinity. Uh, there was an early church heresy uh, that God was not crucified. This is the idea that God cannot suffer. And there were a number of different theories presented to uh, account for this. Uh, Jesus, uh, as in God incarnate, was substituted for someone else before the actual crucifixion. So it wasn't Jesus who was nailed to the cross, it was someone else. Uh, another aspect of this would be that the, the God part of Jesus had departed before the crucifixion. So therefore it was only the human Jesus that was crucified. The first century um, AD, the idea of a crucified Messiah, that would have just been an oxymoron. We can only put those two words together uh, comfortably because of Christian theology. Uh, the crucifixion was a very clear statement um, that the Romans and the Jewish religious establishment had won. And so therefore this messianic pretender had been ignominiously crushed using the ultimate in shameful deaths. Uh, that should therefore should have been the end of the story. The fact that it isn't the end of the story is what we are looking at. So now to move to the main focus of this, which is the resurrection. We're going to look uh, at particular aspects of this. We're going to look at Boltman and Wright. Uh, as um, examples of different positions on the resurrection. We've got to have a quick dip into 
uh, some of the uh, the implications, some of the ways that the resurrection then can feed into understandings of different uh, aspects of Christian doctrine. And we're going to look at the uh, the nature of the resurrected body and the historical reliability of the resurrection. These are just overview, uh, so we're not looking in much detail at any of these. Starting point for this, though, is that the resurrection event, and I'll use that term rather than talking about the resurrection. So the resurrection event is absolutely central to Christianity, whatever it is, uh, and that's what we are looking at here, uh, whatever it is, uh, it is central. And different sections of Christianity then have different understandings of this resurrection event. That's what we're looking at and we're going to explore, um, just dip into uh, Wright and Bultmann to show how you can have uh, the resurrection event central, but then have quite significantly different understandings of what that means. So we're looking at Wright, N.T. Wright, um, modern uh, contemporary theologian. Um, and the important thing for Wright is that he accepts the possibility of miracles. That's a, a starting point. That's one of his axioms. Miracles are possible. He also uh, starts with the idea that Jesus was fully human, fully human man. So we're looking Trinitarian stuff here. It's 100% man, but he's also 100% God, uh, fully humanly dead after the crucifixion. And then uh, Wright's position is that three days in the tomb and Jesus was then resurrected. What Wright means by this is he uh, came alive again bodily but somehow transformed. And then after 40 days like this, he then left Earth in an embodied fall. Bultmann, we're going to use as an example of a modernist position. By modernist, really, we're looking at um, this developed somewhere in the um, middle to late 19th century. And very importantly, an axiom of this position is a rejection of the possibility of miracles. If you've got no miraculous, therefore the resurrection has got to be interpreted some way other than as a historical event. If your axiom says there are no miracles, that the resurrection cannot be a historical event. So you're looking then at, at what would it be metaphorically interpreted, symbolically, existentially, uh, you've got to look at some way of engaging with the resurrection event, which doesn't require a bodily resurrection. Now, without the resurrection, Jesus fits within uh, Jewish patterns of, uh, of operation, really. Uh, you've got those Jewish reforming prophets uh, that we read about in the Old Testament. Uh, look at the uh, book of Amos. You can look into the New Testament uh, for uh, reforming prophet characters. Uh, John the Baptist is described there. So Jesus would have fitted perfectly within that model. He also fits in the pattern of failed messiahs. Uh, there's no shortage of these. A couple of examples, Judas the Galilean, he was 6 AD. Uh, Simon Bar Kokbar, 135 AD. So being a, a messiah wasn't that special uh, and failing as a messiah, or apparently failing as a messiah, um, is also not that unusual. Whether the resurrection is a historical event uh, or not, it's difficult to interpret the New Testament as saying other than uh, it is a historical event and it's the central event which requires a completely new way of looking at everything. So plain reading of the New Testament would deliver that. In the Bible, we find the resurrection included in all four Gospels and it's, it comes unsurprisingly at the end and the subtle differences 
uh, in the way that's presented. And so the major question then would be how significant are those differences in the way that the uh, gospel writers include the account of the gospel? And a major question that's got to be answered is what it was, how this resurrection event transformed the followers of Jesus from becoming just the scattered followers of a failed Messiah to be then becoming hugely confident people who travelled around uh, telling everybody uh, that Jesus was the Messiah. That has to be accounted for. And the resurrection event is clearly what uh, produced that shift. And so we need to look at what sort of uh, resurrection event could produce that change in the followers. The resurrection uh, points us to a number of different aspects of Christian uh, belief, Christian doctrine, Christian practice. So the resurrection um, leads us to look at the question of the miraculous, uh, the whole question of whether miracles can be historical. Uh, we've got religious experience, we've got St Paul meeting the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. Uh, what, uh, what did that mean? What's going on there? We've got uh, some quite important um, concepts, doctrinal concepts like the atonement. Uh, festivals, Easter, uh, is clearly focused on uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus. And then on a weekly basis, or in fact daily for some uh, Christians, uh, you've got the, the idea of the Eucharist. Jesus' death and resurrection is a very central concept within the Eucharist. And it also leads us into looking at the nature of God in the Trinity. So we'll start then with uh, looking at N.T. Wright. So looking at these two contrasting uh, theologians, we'll look at Wright and Boltman. And so we'll start with um, contemporary theologian, uh, born in 1948, still around, still functioning. A New Testament scholar, Church of England uh, scholar, he has was Bishop of Durham for a time. That's prolific writer. You can find lots of Tom Wright on YouTube. Very important here is the axioms that these um, theologians start with. And an axiom for Wright is that miracles are possible, that what is normally termed the miraculous. Uh, that which defies our normal scientific understanding is possible. <clears throat> that doesn't mean to say he's going to believe absolutely anything, uh, any claimed miracle. He doesn't just accept it. But likewise, he's not going to reject it out of hand simply because it is a miracle. <clears throat> so what Wright's got to do then is he's got an axiom which says miracles are possible and he then has to look at the evidence for this specific miracle the resurrection as an empty tomb uh, is there enough evidence to accept it as a historical event it's quite important to realize here the only evidence for this is historical there's no scientific uh, evidence uh, which can be brought to bear. Science cannot tell us that miracles cannot happen. Uh, that's um, uh, uh, another question. So what Wright does is he explores uh, the concept of death and the afterlife in Greek and Hebrew thought and then looks at how uh, this Christian understanding of Jesus' uh, resurrection fits with those ideas, they were the two main strands of thought which were present in Palestine at the time. So you've got the Greek ideas um, where there's no concept at all of bodily resurrection. Uh, for Plato, uh, Plato has this very, um, very strict dualist concept. You've got the soul imprisoned in the, the body, the physical body, and at death, the soul, this immaterial, uh, eternal soul, 
and after death the soul is liberated and it then uh, can have an independent existence but it's an internal soul it's not it's not embodied um, quite a different idea to uh, bodily resurrection that you find in uh, Christian thought. It's also worth it as an aside here, uh, as a huge amount of uh, very Greek thinking has in fact permeated Christianity. So a lot of Christianity is far more Platonic uh, and Greek than it is Hebraic. Now Hebrew thought, is, you need to be careful as you're looking at the Old Testament, you've got a thousand plus years of development in the Old Testament. And by the time of Jesus, there are concepts then of bodily resurrection if some form. And in fact, you can see this. Uh, it's actually explicit within the Gospels where you've got the uh, Sadducees who uh, reject completely bodily resurrection, the Pharisees who accept it. So there's discussion going on internally within Judaism uh, on questions of the resurrection. Now, a slightly quirky idea from Wright, which is quite important and brings out something about Jesus' resurrection, is his idea of life after life after death. So the idea here is that the person dies, they then go into life after death. And that seems to be some sort of um, non-embodied form, uh, a sort of waiting period. Bodily resurrection is what happens after this. So Wright's looking at this in terms of a two-stage process, uh, life after death, and then the resurrection, the bodily resurrection as life after life after death. Moving now to Boltman then, Boltman a uh, towering um, theological figure, um, really very significant in the uh, 20th century in biblical studies and how it was interpreted. Now what he's proposing is an existentialist interpretation of the New Testament. Axioms again, very important. Now the starting point for Bultmann's project, which is known as demythologization, is a complete rejection of miracles. He makes this statement uh, about modern life. So he'd be writing here in, uh, in Germany in the middle of the 20th century. We cannot use electric lights and radios and in the event of illness, avail ourselves of modern medical and clinical means and at the same time believe in the spirit and wonder world of the New Testament. Obviously he wrote that in German, uh, but we're working in English. And of course, that's an, an assertion, really, uh, because there's loads of people around who do use electric lights and radios. And in fact, these days, iPhones um, and uh, have vastly more sophisticated modern medical um, facilities available than Boltman uh, could have known. But at the same time, quite happily uh, accept the concept of the miraculous. But that's Boltman's starting point. It's an axiom. It's not something that is argued. Now, Boltman's project of demythologization is one which says that you read the, Old, the New Testament and the Old Testament and they are just different worlds. They are, don't understand things the same as us. Um, there's lots of, of uh, mythical uh, expression there and that doesn't fit with modern life so therefore we've got to get rid of it and the way that Boltman does this is he doesn't take uh, the line which says we have to um, reinterpret so therefore you've got this resurrection you've got these miracles of Jesus and you've then got to work out look okay, what could you have seen you, know, you time travel back you get out your phone and you video what would we see? Now, Bultman takes a different line here, which is the existentialist uh, approach, which says actually he's not bothered 
about that. That's not a question which he even uh, remotely is interested in. What Bultmann wants to focus on is the meaning of that resurrection event. As far as he's concerned, the fact is, is trivial. That's an important point here that if you did do your time travel back, you time travel back, you video, you come back and you say, oh yeah, okay, Jesus did actually feed the 5,000. Oh yeah, Jesus did actually rise from the dead here. We've got a video of him uh, emerging from the tomb. There could be a response to that as well. Okay, so what? It's the meaning that is of prime importance. And so what Bolton wants to do is focus purely on the meaning and he's got no interest at all in the historical event. And what Bultman uh, wants to focus on is what is termed uh, the kerygma, the proclamation. Uh, this is the what the church presented, uh, the early church presented. Uh, and it's in the kerygma that Jesus is risen from the dead and the, the historical Jesus is of little significance. Let's just do a quick uh, digression into the kerygma. There's a number of these, uh, their lists of what the message of the apostles, the message of that uh, early followers of Jesus, what was the message that was presented in that time immediately after uh, Jesus uh, execution and the resurrection event. Uh, what was it they talked about? Uh, Boltman's got a list. Um, I'm going to use C.H. Dodd, um, a British theologian uh, who comes a bit later than Boltman. I'm going to use his list, uh, but all these, all these lists have got quite a large overlap. And so the idea is that the kerygma, the message, every time you read some sermon or letter or presentation of the early church, what do you get? And you get this idea that there's some sort of age of fulfillment uh, is now here, the latter days. If you read the Old Testament, you've got references to these. And this has taken place. The significance here is it's about birth, life, ministry, death and resurrection of Jesus. You've got this idea that the resurrection event uh, through that Jesus has been exalted at the right hand of God as this messianic head of the new Israel. You've got Trinitarian ideas uh, there. And then you've got the Holy Spirit is the um, empowering of God uh, in the church. And it's a sign then of, of Christ's victory, his glory, his power. And then there's this messianic age uh, will finally wrap everything up in the return of Christ. And then when that's presented, either in its totality or different parts of it, the uh, then the next one is this appeal to the people who are hearing or reading the kerygma, engaging, seeing the kerygma. An appeal is then made that they should repent. There's an offer of forgiveness. The, uh, the Holy Spirit will fill them and salvation. So back to Boltman again. The process Boltman is thinking of here is the people. So we're looking at that period immediately after the resurrection, looking at the Acts of the Apostles period and people encounter the kerygma. They will encounter it in sermons from the apostles. They'll encounter it in just the way they see the early Christians functioning as they live together, as they shared possessions, as they help the poor. So they encounter the kerygma. The next step is that they recognize something within the kerygma which is meaningful to them. And the important thing here is this is probably not them sitting and working things out and looking at empirical evidence and, and laying stuff out as some logical argument. This is uh, at the rather gut level. This is where we come into the existentialist bit of this. And as they encounter the kerygma, they are moved in some way by what they've encountered and then they make that leap of faith and respond existentially to the risen Christ 
which is what they respond to that's within the charisma. They see the risen Christ, they experience the risen Christ, they respond to the risen Christ that they have encountered in the word and deed of these early Christians. And so the risen Christ is encountered existentially uh, in contrast to intellectually worked out from the evidence. The historical Jesus, then, if you think about it, is, well, at best, just irrelevant, but at worst may actually get in the way of somebody making that leap of faith. If they get hung up on questions about, oh, what would we see if we time travelled back, potentially means that they are going to miss the meaning, the profound meaning of the resurrection event uh, and then uh, fail to respond to it. A couple of uh, lengthy quotes um, here from Bultman. Uh, just stop the video and read those. But they're basically, um, th that's the, the rooting uh, what I've just been talking about there in Bultman. OK, let's look then at the resurrection body of Jesus uh, and the implications for understanding death, the soul and the afterlife. There's lots of images of uh, the resurrection body of Jesus. And I chose that one because it uh, looks very clearly embodied. That looks like an ordinary body, but not quite. There's a slight uh, sort of glowy light aspect to it. Um, it's also noticeable. It doesn't seem to have any marks in his hands. But anyway, um, you find lots of depictions. It'd be quite interesting to just have a look, you know, to Google Images, resurrection body of Jesus, and look at how different people have chosen to present the body. One of the things that's certain as you read the gospel accounts um, is that the nature of the resurrection body of Jesus, you can't pin it down exactly because you've got a presentation of Jesus as having sufficiently normal physicality. Uh, Mary thought he was the gardener. That's probably what's being depicted in the image in that opening slide. Um, and so she thinks he's the gardener, has a conversation with him. So he's clearly just ordinarily embodied enough for that. Um, there's the account at the end of John where he uh, meets the disciples on the, um, the shore of the uh, uh, sea of Galilee and he's made them some fish so he's clearly embodied enough that he can um, break the bread and fish doesn't actually say explicitly that he ate it uh, but he can certainly pick the stuff up and break it but it's also clear that those gospel accounts are describing someone who does not have normal physicality because there's several references to him just appearing in a locked room. So he just somehow materializes in the middle of the room. He enters through uh, walls and locked doors. So paradoxes here and uncertainty as to what we are dealing with. St. Paul explores the uh, idea of the resurrection of the body, uh, very particularly in his letter to the church at Corinth, that's chapter 15. In this, he lists the appearances of the risen Jesus. And quite interestingly, he includes in this his own encounter, along with those to the disciples, without making any distinction between them. Uh, the appearances to the disciples were uh, in a period uh, very shortly after the crucifixion and resurrection event. And the, this appearance to Paul, uh, Saul as he then was, uh, would have been at least a decade after that. Paul then works with this idea of a spiritual body. It's quite complicated. He's working with uh, different um, analogies. He talks about, presents the idea of seeds uh, sown with a physical body, raised with a spiritual body. But the main thing there, he's looking at 
uh, a difference and a continuity. The main thing we can pull out from that is that he's rejecting two concepts. One of them is this Greek concept of a purely spiritual soul that exists in disembodied form. And the other concept he rejects is just the straightforward physicality of the body that we have now. So he's presenting the idea that this resurrection body is uh, both the same, but also different to what we have now. The main idea that he's presenting is that it is in some way embodied. The final slides then are the uh, section of 1 Corinthians 15, which is relevant, and then the uh, account of the resurrection from the Gospel of John chapters 20 and 21.